Hello and welcome to another VRTK tutorial video. In this video we're going to show how we can set up a physics button so when we press with our controller the button automatically presses down without needing to press any buttons on our physical controller and we're going to set up this toggle button and then when we press it down it sticks in place and then when we press it again it pops back up. Please consider becoming a VRTK patron. There are plenty of membership levels to sign up at and it really helps to fund these videos. So for the scene with our button, again, we've got a simple scene set up with a physics button container. This has just got some boundary walls that holds our button and then a simple cube which will act as our button. I've also got the physics controllers in this scene because we're going to use them to actually press the button down. But instead of how we've got them set up at the moment, where they've got this toggle logic where we were toggling the physics controller on by pressing the trigger, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this and instead we're going to have an activation area. When they enter that area, they automatically come on. So I'm going to delete the toggle logic in both the right and the left physics controller. And with that done, we'll just collapse our physics controllers for now and then we'll start setting up the physics button. So because this is a physics button, we want to use a joint drive. So we're going to go to Window, then down to Tilia, Interactions, Controllable Creator. And we're going to select the linear joint drive. It's linear because it only moves in one linear direction. So click convert. That turns it into the linear joint drive prefab. We close the controllable creator window. And now all we need to do is go onto our prefab and update the linear drive facade settings to suit our needs. So the first thing we need to do is decide which direction our button is going to move. We want it to move up and down in this instance. So we're going to change our drive axis to Y. So the direction our button will now move is up and down through that white axis. We can see on our gizmo here that it's quite long, which we don't want. So we're going to decrease our drive limit to suit. So a drive limit of 0 0.03 should work fine here. And then if we zoom in here, we can see our drive limit is still shown, but it's quite narrow, which is what we want here. The next thing I'm going to do is just increase the drive speed. I'm just going to put this to about 50. And then what we want to do is we want to start our target value at 1, which means our button will start up in the highest position. So if we align to target value, we can see our button will start up here. And then if we put it all the way to 0 and align, we can see when it's pressed, that's what it will look like. So when it's unpressed, it'll be up here. And then when we press it down, it'll go down to there. But we want it to start at 1. And then what we also want to do is we always want our target value to be moving to 1 as well. So whenever we put pressure on the button, it's always trying to move back into its top position. And that will make sense when we activate our physics controllers. When we push down and move them away, it will naturally snap back up into this top position. So we just do that with the move to target value being ticked and setting target value to 1. And there we go. We've set our button up now. So if we were to push our physics controllers or any other physics object onto our button, it would move down. And then when we move them away, it would release and pop back up. But what we want to do now is set up this activation area so we know we can actually put our controllers in. It will automatically turn on our physics controllers so we don't have to do anything. We can press the button and then move them away and it will turn off our physics controllers. So to do that, we're going to create a game object in here. I'm just going to use a 3D object cube and I'm going to call this activation area. And the reason I'm using a cube for this is I actually don't want the mesh in the end, but it just makes it easy to see where this collider will actually fill. So I'm just going to change the transform settings. So I'm just going to put the Y at 0.05 and then the scale at 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.25. And we can see that's now our bounding area. Anytime it goes in here, we're going to turn on our collider. And as I say, I don't actually need the mesh, so I can just delete the mesh renderer and the mesh filter. And we're just left with the box collider, which is all we actually want. Now the next thing I need to do is make sure our box collider is actually a trigger collider because we don't want it to actually prevent anything from going in it. We just want to know when something has gone into it so it's a trigger. And we're going to add a collision tracker component to this. And the collision tracker component will just tell us when something has entered this area and when something has left that area. And we get the collision started and the collision stopped which we'll come back to in a moment. So the next thing we need to do now is know which controller has entered our activation area to know which physics controller to turn on or off. So we've got the right one and the left one, but we want only to turn the left one on when our left controller enters. And we only want to turn the right one on when our right controller enters. So we're going to set up some logic to do that now. So in our physics button container, I'm just going to create a new empty game object and I'm going to call this controller rules. And this is just going to hold the rules which determines which controller has entered our activation area. 
So first of all, I'm going to use a list contain rules to just check to see if the list contains our tracked alias interactor. And we can create that simply by going to window, Zinnia, observable list component generator. And then from the component type, select list contain rules and click generate component. And we can close this down now. And then if we look in container rules, we've got the list contain rules container. I'm just going to rename this to is left controller. And all we need to do to set this up now is make sure we've got one element in here. And we know the thing that's going to enter when it's our left controller is actually going to be our left interactor. So our left interactor is the list contain rules here. And then we want to do the same for the right controller. So I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to rename it to is right controller. And then instead of having the left interactor in there, we're going to use the right interactor. So grab, drag and drop that into our list contain rules. Now we need to set up some rules that can match when the collision starts and the collision stops. And depending on which controller has started or stopped the collision, we want to do something on that. So we're going to create a new empty game object to hold that logic. And we'll do the collision started first. So I'll call this collision started. And if we just go quickly back to our activation area, we can see when our collision starts, we get this event data payload. So we need to extract the information out of that payload. So if we go back to collision started, we're going to add a notifier container extractor component. And what this will do is it will extract the game object from that collision out for us. And then we get this event triggered here, this extracted, which gives us the actual game object, which is what we're going to use. And then we're going to use that within a rules matcher component as well. We can set one of those up easily by going to window, Zinnia, observable list component generator. And then from the component type, we just select rules matcher and click generate component. Then we can close this window down. And if we look in collision started, we can see we've got a rules matcher container. And now all we need to do on our collision started, notify container extractor. When this extract happens, we're going to add a listener and we're going to put our rules matcher container in there. And then for the function, we're going to select rules matcher and just call match. Now let's set up our rules matcher to do some work for us. So in our rules matcher, we're going to create two rules. And for the first rule, we're going to use our is left controller. And for our second rule, we're going to use that is right controller. And what this will do is when our collision starts, it will pass through whichever controller has made that collision. And if it's the left controller that's made that collision, we're going to check that in this left controller rule. And if that has happened, what we're going to do in the matched is we're going to turn on the left collider follower. So drag, drop the left collider follower and then game object set active all true. And the same for the is right controller. If we've matched the right controller, what we're going to do here is turn on our right collider and game object set active ball true. So these rules now will work. So if a left controller goes into our activation area, our activation area will then use this matcher to match whether it's the left or right controller and turn on the relevant physics controller that we want. We also need one of these for collision stop. So I can just select collision started, copy and paste this. And then I'm going to rename this to collision stopped. And then if we expand this, it's also copied over the rules matcher as well. And instead of actually turning these on now, we just want to turn them off when the collision has stopped. So we untick both of these. So now we've got in this rules matcher, they both go on. And in this rules matcher, they both go off. And finally, all we need to do now is in our activation area, we need to hook up our collision started event to our collision started and our collision stopped event to our collision stopped. So we'll add a listener in here, drag in our collision started, and then for the function, we're going to go to the notify container extractor and just call do extract. And then for collision stopped, we're doing the same on collision stopped. Drag drop collision stopped. Go to the function, notify container extractor, do extract. And that's it. That's all we need to set up. Whenever our controllers now pass into the activation area, what they will do is activate the physics controller. Allow us to push down on that physics button because it's a joint based button and we'll be able to interact with it without needing to press any physical buttons on our controller. So we've got the one button set up now, and what this button will do is when we put our controller over it and push down, it will activate the physics controller. That will push on the physics button, pushing it all the way down to the bottom, and then when we move our controller away, the button will automatically pop back up. What we're also going to do now is set up another button. So this button will pop all the way back up on its own, we're going to create another button now where we press it down and it toggles into its on position. And then when we press it again, it pops back up into its off position. So to do this, I'm just going to make a copy of this button. We'll move it over here and then we'll make a copy and I'll move that one over here. And I'll rename the container to physics button container toggle. 
and we'll just collapse all this stuff up as we don't need it now and if we expand our physics toggle what we need to do now is just create a toggle action in here and we'll add a toggle action component and now what we'll do is when we press the button down all the way all we need to do is in our activated we're going to select our button and in our button in the linear drive facade we're just going to change its target value which is default setting to one so it'll pop all the way back up to one when we press it all the way down we don't want it to pop all the way back up now we just want it to pop up a little bit so we're going to change that from one to something like 0 0.1 and then when we press the button again it will call our deactivated and at that point we want our button to pop all the way back up so in here we're going to drag our button again and we're just going to change the target value back to the default of one so select from the linear drive facade select target value and then just put one to prevent this toggle action from re-triggering when we want it to pop back up what we're actually going to do is disable the toggle action when it is popping back up so we're going to just add the toggle action to here and turn the game object set active ball and leave it as false. And that will prevent it from staying in an unlimited stuck position. And then when it pops back up, we're going to turn this toggle action back on so we can stick down again. Now, all we need to do is set up the actions to call this toggle action. So in our drive, we're going to expand this, look at the drive value events. And then in event output, we've got the minimum reached when it's pressed all the way down and the maximum reached. Let's do minimum reach first. So when it gets all the way down to the minimum, what we want it to do is actually call this toggle action. So when we've pressed it all the way down, we want this to receive true. And then the first time it will stick and then the second time it will pop back up. So on minimum reached, in activated, add a listener, drag in toggle action, and then in the function, toggle action, and then just call receive the dynamic ball, which will be true, which is what we want here. And then in maximum reached, when it gets back to the top, we just want to turn our toggle action back on so we can reuse it again in the future. So activated toggle action and then turn the game object back on. And there we go. We've now set up two buttons, one which we'll just press down and pop immediately back up when we move our controller. And another one that when we press down, it will stay down until we press it again and then it will pop back up. So let's jump into the scene and see that working. So now we're in the scene, we can see if we move our controller into the activation area, we can see our green tracked controller that appears, and that's our physics controller. So when we push down on our button, we can see it's that actual physics controller that's pushing our button up and down. And when we move our controller away, the button pops back up. And then if we go to our toggle button, same again, when we go into the activation area, our physics controller turns on. But now when we press all the way down, it will stay in that locked position. And then when we press again, it will pop back up. So we've created a toggle button and just a normal pressable button. And there we go. I hope you found this video useful. If you have, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel. Leave any likes, dislikes, comments down below. And please consider becoming a VRTK patron. See you for the next video. Thanks for watching and bye for now.